So again, you have these other churches starting, other discipling churches. Um, if we roll everything forward to the mid-1980s, they were starting to pop up in a lot of places. Um, I believe in 1986, Chuck Lucas, he uh, stepped down. He was caught uh, in impropriety with uh, someone. So the original church in Gainesville, Florida, decided to let him go. So Crossroads at that point was was pretty much the writing was on the wall. It was dying. And most of it would be reincorporated into the Boston movement throughout the 1980s. And in 1989, um, I believe that was the, it was 1989 or 1990, um, was the year that they were changed their name from the Boston Church of Christ. And there was separation from the other churches of Christ and they became the international churches of Christ. So at that time, they looked practically unstoppable. However, and this is revealed by someone who was there, um, I believe his name is Andy Fleming. He ran some numerical analysis on the statistics of how churches were growing, how many members they were, they were, they were getting, how many people were leaving. And at that point, they saw the writing on the wall where the original, all these other churches were growing like crazy. But the Boston church is actually slowing down for several different factors. Number one, you can't keep up that type of growth forever. Number two, they were sending out a lot of their leadership to plant these other churches. So they had to raise up other leaders and that caused growth to slow down. So there were some internally, none of us knew this was going on. This is something that was kind of revealed maybe, I don't know, this past year or so at least widespread, and they made it known in a widespread fashion. They, um, you know, they said that the um, individual congregations weren't growing, well, were growing like crazy. Boston wasn't growing as fast. So they decided to kind of suggest, like, hey, how about we kind of tweak things a little bit to keep Boston going and kind of spread out some of the control a little bit, you know, maybe – not have separate autonomous congregations within town, but kind of, kind of have less, have less control from the central control point. Kit McKee wouldn't have any of it. So what he did, he left Boston and started, um, the Los Angeles Church of Christ and let, let Los Angeles do his own thing. And he also doubled down in 1994 saying, okay, we are going to, have a church in every nation um, that has at least a population of 100,000 or so by the year 2000. So that put even more pressure on the entire ICOC than the 1990s to grow and produce. And technically, in six months before the year 2000, in the mid-1999, they technically hit their goal of having all the churches and at least a church plant in every United States state quote unquote, that never really didn't happen. And I, they got me in 1998. I'll tell you my story here in a little bit. But at that time, the leadership and everything was ragged and people were starting to lose control over the people they recycled and things became very unstable. Um, there were, and throughout the time, throughout the late 1960s and the 70s and 80s, there were people who were leaders in this movement. They stepped out and they said, hey, this is wrong. There's abuse going on. You know, we tried to handle this in a biblical way with Kip, but he wouldn't have any of it. He's the one in sin here, not us. Um, but it all eventually came to a head in um, year 2002. Kip's oldest daughter, he set up rules to kind of control everything. One of the things was for you to be an evangelist, which is their top level leader, not the elder, you need to be an evangelist. To be a top level leader, your kids had to be quote unquote faithful, which means that they either had to be younger than a teenager and be, you know, not rebelling or going out of control or anything relative to their age. Or if they were a teenager, they would have become a church member and be faithful. 
Well, it turns out that Kip's oldest daughter, Olivia, went off to Harvard. And when she was out of control from her parents, and especially they sent one person specifically out there with her to kind of be her personal discipleship partner so that she could keep, a, keep an eye on her. Um, but basically she broke away from that. She went into massive debauchery. Um, his other two sons followed relatively quickly after that. And basically this gave a lot of the other people in the ICSC leadership at the time enough push to get Kip out of there mm. because he basically became a power hungry dictator. Mm. So that happened at the end of 2002. Kip was removed from the central leadership of the ICOC as their main identifiable leader. And then early 2003, the other, if you think about it, and this was inevitable, if you had one person controlling and clamping down on control for over 20 years or so, and that power is suddenly gone, chaos will ensue, and it did ensue. There was a guy named Henry Crete, who released a letter on uh, in or around uh, Groundhog Day, February 2003, where he basically said, yeah, we're cold and we're abusing people and we need to fix this. So that caused a lot of people to leave. That caused a lot of chaos. That caused basically the whole discipling system and structure to completely break down. And many people left at that time. I did not, at least not yet. Um, so the ICOC kind of went off into the wilderness for a while. Um, and to kind of see where they've been in the last 15 years or so, they have not reestablished a strict hierarchical pyramid, but there is control of churches over other churches. There's still mm -hmm. discipling of people over other people to a degree. It's not as formalized across the entire movement as it was, but it's still dangerous and it's still unbiblical and still hurting and abusing people. So what happened with Kit McKean at that time in 2004, uh, the ICOC, someone made a deal with him, internal politics and all that, for him to take over a church, the ICOC congregation in Portland, Oregon. And when he took over the church in Portland, Oregon, he basically restarted what he did with Boston back in 1979. Um, within a couple of years, he grew people around himself. He separated from the ICOC, and he basically started to replant churches that were loyal to him. 